if somebody wants to find a way around the biblical teaching, there's always a way to do it. In other words, if somebody's looking at the passage already committed to a certain narrative, they can come up with some Greek word or some way to twist the scriptures to sound like it supports it. But I've also found that if you actually study the passages in context carefully, the Bible is very straightforward about God's design for marriage and sex. That God designed marriage to be one man and one woman who become one union for one lifetime. So I think the Bible is very straightforward, but I've learned that a lot of Christians don't know what they believe and why, which is why people are being taken in by many faulty ideas that really the scriptures don't teach. So we have this thing called gay Christianity hitting the church, people who are practicing homosexuals and calling themselves Christian, taking and twisting scripture, what we call revisionist theology, there's one uh, is very known, Matthew Vines, with the Reformation Project, uh, so much so that the, the idea is having um, conferences to train church folk to make an appeal for gay Christians, and, um, and they're explaining away scripture. Many conservative Christians believe that the Bible condemns all same-sex relationships. That question drove my own intensive study of this issue when I came to terms with being gay. As both my parents and my church in Kansas believed that gay marriage was wrong. But what I learned when I studied the relevant scripture passages changed my parents' minds, along with the views of many other Christians in my life. There are six passages in the Bible that refer to same-sex behavior. Three in the Old Testament and three in the New Testament. The most famous passage is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, God sends two angels disguised as men into the city of Sodom, where the men of Sodom threaten to rape them. The angels blind the men, and God destroys the city. For centuries, this story was interpreted as God's judgment on same-sex relations. But the only form of same-sex behavior described is a threatened gang rape. Ezekiel 16:49 sums up the story's focus on violence and hostility towards strangers. Now this was the sin of your sister Sodom, she and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. There are people, they're, they're already prepared to go, well, yeah, but if you go to Ezekiel 49, it says that the sin there was a lack of hospitality and stuff like that. They normally only quote that partially. They, they do say, had ease of living and lack of hospitality, things like that. But the very next verse says, and they committed toeva, abomination before me. And the Toeva language is the exact language that is used of homosexuality back in Leviticus 18 and 20. And so someone who's tuned into that recognizes that, that no one's arguing that the only sin for which Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed was homosexuality. And no one's going to argue that all the men of the city surrounded the house, that that was not a relevant, violent act as well. But it was the desire that they had that is, when, when Lot comes out, he says, do not do this evil thing. And it's when he says this evil thing that, who are you to judge us? Well, what is the evil thing? Uh, Bring them out that we may know them. What's the know there mean? It's clear what is going on here. And so people will try to, to escape that element of it by saying, well, you're just saying it was homosexuality. No, there were other sins that were involved in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, but you can't escape the reality that what was toeva, what was the abomination, was that fundamental disruption of the proper sexual desire. And it was present there. You can't get rid of it no matter what you do. In Leviticus 18.22, male same-sex intercourse is prohibited, and violators are to receive the death penalty. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Other things called abominations in the Old Testament include having sex during a woman's menstrual period, eating pork, rabbit, or shellfish, and charging interest on loans. But they're part of the Old Testament law code, which was fulfilled by Jesus. The famous episode of The West Wing aired that popularized the argument against the Bible's teaching on homosexuality, where you can mock Christians for not being consistent in how they handle the Old Testament law code. 
I like how you call homosexuality an abomination. I don't say homosexuality is an abomination, Mr. President. The Bible does. Yes, it does. Leviticus. 1822. Chapter and verse. I wanted to ask you a couple of questions while I had you here. I'm interested in selling my youngest daughter into slavery, as sanctioned in Exodus 21-7. She's a Georgetown sophomore, speaks fluent Italian, always cleared the table when it was her turn. What would a good price for her be? Does the whole town really have to be together to stone my brother John for planting different crops side by side? Can I burn my mother in a small family gathering for wearing garments made from two different threads? Think about those questions, would you? What that highlighted and illustrated was our own failure to give a fully biblical understanding of human sexuality, morality, and the role of God's law. The fact is, in the majority of our churches, you do not have regular, consistent teaching on the relationship between God's law and the application in the New Testament. And so they can get away with it. And they, this has been used to silence Christians all across our culture. Every generation of Christians has had to deal with developing a proper understanding of how to recognize universal, overarching moral principles and the closer application that God made within the people of Israel, but it takes an extra level of study. I did 35 sermons on the Holiness Code, and they're available online, and we, we tackled everything. There is a text in Deuteronomy that if two men are fighting and a woman reach out, reaches out to aid uh, one of them and grabs the genitals of a man, she has to have her hand cut off. We preached a sermon on that. So we didn't skip anything. Uh, but once you've laid the foundation, then you can go ahead and apply those things. And I just found it, to be honest with you, there were certain texts that at first, when I approached them, I'm like, oh Lord, what in the world am I gonna do? And then once you've established certain uh, grounds, they're, they're beautiful and they're, they, they promote justice. So one argument that's put forward is sort of the, uh, the, some of the text that we find in Leviticus 19 between the sex laws in Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20. Uh, like, for example, uh, not sowing with two different kinds of seed uh, or not wearing clothes with two different kinds of cloth and that sort of thing. What they fail to understand, though, is that the texts that they're citing there um, really are understood, those particular texts are understood, understood as having symbolic value. Whereas when we're talking about sexual offenses in Leviticus 18 and 20, we're not talking about mere symbolism. So when we're talking about adultery, for example, adultery isn't just a symbol for something else. Incest is not just a symbol for something else. You really are not to commit adultery. You really are not to commit incest uh, or bestiality or same-sex intercourse. These are do have symbolic import, but it extends well beyond that to a literal prohibition of these acts. Issues about cloth and seed are a way of promoting the view that Israel has to be separate from a prevailing culture in the ancient Near East, which promotes lots of unethical forms of behavior and idolatrous worship. So uh, accordingly, um, these views about seed and cloth symbolize that. With regard to sexual relations, however, there are purity standards that have been binding on the Christian church, and before that, ancient Israel, from the very beginning of creation on. Uh, when we look at the sexual offenses in Leviticus 18 and 20, there are good reasons for regarding it, not merely as purity offenses, but as um, ethical standards that are still binding today. Uh, a lot of purity offenses, you can become impure simply by touching somebody, coming into contact with somebody. The sexual offenses are not issues of contagion. You can't you can't catch adultery. You can't catch homosexual practice, incest, bestiality. Um, purity offenses often aren't concerned with issues of whether or not you intended to do something. If you inadvertently come into contact with things uh, or eat things accidentally you shouldn't eat, you're automatically rendered impure. Whereas the sexual offenses in Leviticus 18 and 20 are very clear about willful intent. The only persons who are penalized 
are those who willfully engage in this activity. So the text says in Leviticus 20, their blood be upon them. In the text, they're referred to as iniquity or sin in Leviticus 18. Uh, you cannot be absolved of the behavior merely by ritual means, like the sun going down or ritual bathing. Uh, these are offenses that are also taken up in the New Testament, uh, the sexual laws in Leviticus 18 and 20, not true of the ritual impurity offenses. They also have implicit rationales for each of them as to why you should not engage in the behavior. In the case of homosexual unions, you shall not do it because a man shall not be treated as a woman, as though he were a sexual counterpart to a man, uh, when in fact he is of the same sex. So for all these reasons and more, they are regarded as moral purity offenses and not merely ritual purity offenses. In Romans 1, verses 26 and 27, people who turn away from God to worship idols are then turned over to their own lusts and vices. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Paul's words here are clearly negative, but the behavior he condemns is lustful. He makes no mention of love, commitment, or faithfulness. His description of same-sex behavior is based solely on a burst of excess and lust. In the ancient world, same-sex behavior mainly occurred between adult men and adolescent boys, between masters and their slaves, or in prostitution. Most of the men engaged in those practices were married to women, so same-sex behavior was widely seen as stemming from out-of-control lust, a vice of excess, like gluttony or drunkenness. One of the most common arguments we hear is that the kind of homosexual behavior we see in the Bible is different than the covenant, love, faithful, monogamous, same-sex unions we see today. And my pushback is to say it's irrelevant. Covenant, faithfulness, monogamous commitment doesn't overturn God's design for sex and marriage. You can go back to Genesis 1, God made them male and female. Go to Genesis 2, man shall leave his father and leave his mother, cling to his wife, so we're talking about marriage, and the two shall become one. And that's how they populate and fill the earth. Well, when Jesus asked about marriage, he cites both Genesis 1 and he cites Genesis 2. That God designed marriage to be one man, one woman, who become one flesh for one lifetime. So whether it's monogamous or whether it's faithful or committed over time is irrelevant to God's design that marriage is a gendered institution oriented towards having children and is a permanent union. These factors that are brought up don't change that. We also look in the Bible and you realize that there was a kind of consensual sexuality that was taking place. So look in Leviticus 18, a man shall not sleep with a man as he does with a woman. Well, if you skip two passages forward, they are both punished for this, which tells us it was consensual. There are some examples of consensual relationships, which tells us that this charge doesn't completely work. In the last two likely references to same-sex behavior in the Bible, two Greek words, malakoi and arsenikoitai, are included in lists of people who will not inherit God's kingdom. Many modern translators have rendered these terms as sweeping statements about gay people. But the concept of sexual orientation didn't even exist in the ancient world. What's really instructive is Paul in 1 Corinthians 6 and in 1 Timothy 1 is very clearly using the same language from Leviticus 18 and 20. If you read the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, there are these, these two words used in Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20, arson and koites. It means man and bed. And Paul is quite deliberately pulling those two words and he makes a word that never existed before. We don't have any record of it. And he uses it in 1 Corinthians 6 and in 1 Timothy 1 to put this word together as man betters, uh, meaning those who practice homosexuality. And so when Paul writes to the Corinthians, he specifically says homosexuals will not inherit the kingdom of God. He uses the language that draws directly out of the Old Testament 
puts them together and says, this is a reality, do not be deceived. But then we can't stop there. That is true, that is a reality, that needs to be accepted. And any book you read, you need to look at how they deal with 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, and see if they're honest about that. But on the other hand, if you read a Christian book that stops there and doesn't go to verse 11 and says, but such were some of you, but you were washed, you were justified, you were cleansed in the name of our God and name of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't get to the redemptive element of it, well, then you've lost the, the whole point of what Paul is saying. And that is that this is not an unforgivable sin. This is not something that uh, he, he says to the Corinthians, such were some of you, but there's been a radical change. But here's something that I think each one of us has to make a decision about. We're gonna live in a day, we are living in a day right now, and our children and grandchildren will face this to a level that I don't, unless God grants repentance that, uh, that we, we've never faced. And that is the demand is being made within the church and the demands being made outside of the church to alter the tense of the verb in 1 Corinthians 6. What do I mean by that? It says such were some of you. It's a past tense. I've, I've examined all of the, uh, of the manuscripts that we have available for 1 Corinthians chapter 6 just to make sure. Um, there, are, there, are no, there is no evidence whatsoever uh, of any manuscript anywhere uh, that would say such are some of you. Paul said such were. He introduced a fundamental disjunction between the practice of these acts and what it means to be a Christian. You've laid those things aside. This has to do with how we identify ourselves. This has to do with the Revoice Conference. This has to do with all of these things. The society is demanding of us, people within the church are demanding of us that we change the tense of the verb in 1 Corinthians 6, 11. To such are some of you. And if you won't, first it's jobs, access to the public communication, whether it be Facebook or Twitter or the internet, eventually I could see the younger generation today, once they have political authority, saying that's hate speech and therefore is worthy of not only civil penalties, but eventually the government itself uh, silencing that kind of speech. Um, unless something changes, I don't see how you can argue that that's what's coming down the line. Um, so where do we stand? Can we change God's words? Can we change the tense? It's just the tense of a verb, come on. To be able to get along with everybody, can't you just change the tense of a verb? Well, what if you change the tense of a verb in John 1, 1? In the beginning was the word. What if you change that simply from what's called the Greek imperfect, which means that the word had eternally existed in the past, change it to the aorist, againeta. The word came into existence. You've now completely changed the faith. We don't have the luxury to edit what God has said. Because once you do it in one verb, one little tense, under the pressure of the society here, why not everywhere else?